God bless everyone. Amen. Mia, thank you for that blessing. Awesome, awesome. Today I want to continue on our theme of recharge. We're going to stay the same theme that Margaret started last week on the lost sheep. So I want to open up with uh, Luke chapter 15 and we're going to go through the whole chapter. And I'm going to ask that as, uh, as we reflect in these days, on our quest to fulfill the great commandment of evangelizing, that we learn to embrace chapter 15 of Luke. They are three of the most powerful, powerful parables that Jesus has given. Because it is here that we learn the beauty of what Jesus came to do for all of us. So with that, let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we just wanna thank you, Father, for the time that we've set apart for you, Lord, a time when we come possibly with a burden, broken, filled with anxiety, depression. But Lord, we know that when we come into your presence, Lord, we know that you are the ultimate calm in the storms of life, Father. And it is here that we come to find rest and peace, Father. And we know, Lord, that where you are, O oh Lord, your spirit is. And where your spirit is, there is peace, comfort, and rest for all of us. And so, Lord, we just ask and pray that you would remove anything that hinders your word, O oh Lord, from coming forth with boldness and gladness to the praise and glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's open our Bibles and we're going to read chapter 15 in the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 15 reads the following. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who did not repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And he continued. He says, there was a man with two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after, the young son got together all that he had and he set off for a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to a census, he said, how many of my father's servants have food to spare and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your higher servants. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. 
Let us have a feast and celebrate, for the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is now found. So we began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked, what's going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back and safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go to him. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, after all these years, I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours has squandered your property with prostitutes and come home, you killed the fattened calf. And the father says to him, my son, you're always with me, and everything that I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. These parables are why our Savior died for us. These parables are to be memorized by all of us to remember that God, God loves the lost sinner. And it doesn't matter where we are in life, God will never give up on us. He'll always pursue us. These parables speak volumes of sinful behaviors that we take for granted. And I say we take for granted because we don't realize that we are embarking in these sinful activities. These parables speak of dishonor, dishonor to a father who was willing to give everything he had to a son, but the son didn't cherish that. They speak of disrespect, disrespect for a father that the son knew better. Jealousy of a brother who couldn't see the value of a son who repented to come back. It speaks volumes of narcissism, individuals who just care about themselves. The title of this message today is, It's All About Me. It's all about me. The precious gold that these parables have are a foundation of our understanding of evangelism. Today we live in a time in history where right is wrong. Wrong is right. Tolerance is no longer a word of value. You ever heard that from people? Why are you so intolerant, you Christian? And we're accused of being very intolerant. Society in general no longer tolerates anything that may conflict with the worldview. And the worldview of today is that it is all about me. I have a right to have an opinion of whatever I desire. Even if it doesn't align with your worldview, you have to respect my opinions. We're taught that we must be respectful and tolerant of people's worldviews. World and in the end, we find ourselves demonstrating just the opposite. We become intolerant. We become impatient. We become very judgmental. We become opinionated towards others. Because if people don't line up with what we believe as Christians, we immediately become very judgmental in how we see them. A couple of weeks ago, we were deep in uh, chapter uh, 13, 14 of Romans. And we're talking about how we, too, here within the church, Christians, we have such a judgmental spirit about us. We have an opinion because people don't line up to where we are in our Christian view. Because we believe that people should be as holy as we are. And that's not our work, brothers and sisters. God accepts us right where we are. And every one of us is in a different journey in our quest of salvation. Now that doesn't mean that we're not saved, but the Bible says that we are being sanctified every day. And in that process of sanctification, we're gonna go through stuff. And that stuff that we go through is the very thing that God is using to purify us. Weren't those the lyrics of the song today? I wanna be tried by fire, purified. You see, as Christians, we don't like that. We love the lyrics. It'll break us and it'll minister to us. 
But deep down, when we're being tried by that fire, we don't like it. And in that vein, we, we, we must remember that that fire that is trying us as Christians is showing who we really are as brothers and sisters in Christ. The world will see us as we go out and embark and try to minister to people. And, there's, and they're going to relate to us more, not based on what we're saying to them, but more by the fires that we've gone through in life. And we're going to be able to testify of the work that God has done as he pulled us through those fires. And we might still be in that fire, but we know that we're not alone. We're like Daniel and the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In the fire of pit, in the pit of fire. And wherever we are, we know the Lord is here with us and we're going through some stuff. Those are the things that we need to embrace as we go out and we begin to say, how do I minister to somebody? Well, start with the fires of your life. What have you gone through? We have no compassion. And when I say that, I'm saying that in a general sense. We all have moments of lack, lacking of compassion. We lack empathy because we forget that we, we were that person that's going through some stuff. And we forget that. And we become very judgmental because sometimes we think that that person knows better. He should have already gone beyond that. And we, and we need to forget, we need to remember that we can't forget where we came from. Is that life is a process of us going through all these different challenges in life and knowing that God's going to do the work in our life. We find it wasteful to pursue someone who may be lost today. We forget to look in the mirror of life and remember that we were once lost. The lost people in the world, to a certain point, sometimes don't matter to us because we're so worried about me because life is about me. I don't care about the other person. It's about me. Let them get their life right with God. We are our brother's keeper. We've been sharing this for the last several weeks. We are responsible for our fellow man. A few weeks ago, I opened up the message or the series with, let's stop loving people to hell. Let's stop that. Society, in general, the church. When I say society and the church are two complete different uh, groups but to, but society in general and the church it's also guilty of this it's filled with countless individuals who think that they're good enough and we're not good enough we're really not it's the lesson that we learn in the lost coin they measure their worth based on personal values you know I'm good enough look at who I am I don't bother people I live a good life I pay my taxes I don't bother my neighbors I don't, I've never been in jail. I don't speed, I don't, I don't do any of that. You know, I'm a good person. But those are the standards of the world. Those standards, when we stand before the Lord on our day of judgment, he doesn't care about that. He really doesn't. And that's something that we need to get across to every individual that we know that is living a lost life. But there's one person, the lost coin. As I prepared this message and I've read these parables, I really receive a greater appreciation for the lost coin. That lost coin had the same value as the other nine. She has 10 silver coins. Now, the presumption here is that every coin had equal value. But why was it so important that the lost one had a greater value to her? What was it about that? And how do we associate that lost coin to all of us? Imagine yourself in a room of 10 righteous people. I'm speaking to the righteous ones. I'm not speaking to the lost ones. I'm speaking to the righteous ones. And they all think they're good enough. And they all believe, ah, oh, you know, I'm doing all these great things. They're that Pharisee that we learned in that other parable. The one, you know, the one he's, he's sitting there in the temple and he's saying, Lord, thank you. I'm not like that sinner over there. You remember that one. But the publican, he was a lost coin. That's who he was. He was a man who recognized, I don't measure up, Lord. Lord, I need you, Lord. I've, 
lived a, and squandered my life. I've been lost, Lord. But today I've been found because I've embraced the grace and mercy that you've offered to me. And sometimes we forget that. It's the lost that the Lord came to find. He didn't come to find those who are healed, those who, are, who, who you know, uh, uh, the Bible uses, uh, or Jesus uses as an example. I didn't come for the sick. I'm sorry, I didn't come for the ones that were healthy. I came for the sick. The individuals who are lost, the individuals who are going through stuff, the individuals who truly are in need of a physician, a spiritual physician. Let us never forget that we are the perfect handiwork of a loving creator. He created us for his pleasure. Did you know that? Did you know, did you know why you were created? Did you know why you're here? For his great pleasure. That's it. For the pleasure of God. And sometimes we forget that. Ephesians 1 says that he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which is purpose in Christ. Margaret spoke last week of the lost sheep. That parable reaffirms the value of the lost. Our shepherd, Jesus Christ, is going to leave and is willing to leave all 99 of us because he knows that you are safe in his hands. He's going to go after the one that's lost. Do you ever notice this month uh, about mothers? I can say, I can share this because I, I live this in my own family with my mom. And we always wonder why moms have a special, special heart for the black sheep in the family. Do you ever, you ever know that? And the children, we get very jealous. You know, in my home, we had a couple black sheep. Not just one, we had two. And we always wondered, you know, why is mom always so worried about it? I mean, she gives him more attention, why? You know, we, we, we were like like the brother in the prodigal son story. Mom, we, we're, like, mom we're good kids. We've done all the, uh, we, we've done our chores. We, we, we've been good, we've gone to church. We've done all these good things. But why are you always worried about him? Leave him alone. Love him to hell. Interactively, that's what we're saying, isn't it? We don't think it that way, but that's, that's in essence what we're doing. But the love of a mother was taught to her by her Heavenly Father. He taught that mother, and we'll learn next week, and I, I, I really know Margaret's going to bring a powerful message for the mothers next week, but we learned that a mother's, a mother's place was how God has done a work in her life, in her life, there's no judging of a mother. And that mother, I don't care how bad that child has been, that child that is the black sheep will get more love, more attention than the others. You know why? Because she knows that the other children, she, she's like the shepherd in the story. These other 99 kids of mine, they're okay. They're gonna be fine. But this one here, I'm gonna pray more for this one. I'm gonna go after this one more. I'm gonna minister more to this one because her faith is so strong that she knows that God is gonna answer that prayer. It's the same thing in that parable. The black sheep of the world are all out there and it's our responsibility to go up there and try to help them, bring them back onto the right path. The prodigal son, I love that parable since I was a teenager. The first time I heard that, I truly embraced it. And the power behind the prodigal son is this. Every single one of us can relate to that parable. Every one of us has been a prodigal. Every one of us has sought our own way. Every one of us has asked our Heavenly Father for our inheritance. Give me what's mine. I want to go out and live life to the largest. I want to squander it. I want to just be, oh, I want to be it. And we might not come off that way, but indirectly, that's exactly who we are and that's what we're becoming. That's what we do. 
But the prodigal son's story is a powerful story, a powerful reminder for all of us. You can read that and you can come up with 10, 20 different things in that parable. For me, the most powerful thing in that parable is it's all about grace. The grace of God. The unmerited favor of God. An individual who, who outwardly told his father. You know, imagine us that if we were so bold enough. Now I'm going to say this. I want you to really you know, wrap your head around what I'm going to tell you. That we were so bold to say, God, give me what is mine and I want it now. And God, there it is. A trillion dollars. Live your life so much. And we go out and we live our life. Because that's what God had done for us. He's given us a trillion dollars in our life for us to live our life however we want to live it. And how we take that inheritance says a lot about how much we have valued our Creator. The parable speaks of unconditional love. When the Father saw the Son coming, what did he do? Lock the doors, everybody. Lady. That, 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 that horrible son of mine is coming back. I don't want him back in this house. Turn off the lights. Is that what he did? No. Completely the contrary. He ran to him, the Bible says. He ran to him. He tells his servants, get the fatted calf. Get it ready. You know, in that culture, to prepare the fatted calf was to prepare uh, uh, you know, that calf for a very special celebration. It wasn't just done for any, but that was a special celebration. And you realize that my son, whom asked for his inheritance, has realized that what he's done has been a sin. And he has realized that at the end of his life, while he was there in the pig pen, eating that, which was only worthy for a pig, that he came to a census. And it is there that he realized, I need to go back to my father. Because at that point, he realized this, it was the trillion dollars didn't matter anymore. And that's how we are. That's how we have realized who we are as a prodigal. It no longer matters the value of everything that we've received in life, whether it's monetary, whether it's a title, position, whether it's, it's your family, what, what, whatever it is that you sought in life, you realize that none of that matters. There's only one thing that has mattered to us. And when you finally get to that point in life when you realize that seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you, you embrace a completely different dynamic of life. Because that's the dynamic that we need to share to individuals. That we can be like a prodigal and go out there and squander all that we have. Brothers and sisters, I'll tell you this. We all know countless individuals who are very intelligent, very good. I'll use that loosely by worldly standards, but they're good people. They might have very good morals. Matter of fact, I'll, I'll even boldly say they're probably better than us with how they live their life. Because they live their life based on their worldview and, and, and they work hard to try to just be a good person. But in the end, what do they really have to show for their life at the end of their life? That I got this degree, I got this position, I accomplished all this wealth, this property, this materialism. Is that really what's gonna matter? Statistics tell us that individuals Individuals who have amassed tremendous wealth have a higher propensity to suicide. Why is that? They have it all. They have their trillion dollars. What, just pick a number, whatever, whatever, whatever insane amount of money you can imagine. They have it all. But they go on a quest for life to try to find complete purpose and meaning. And they squander it like the prodigal on prostitutes and a loose living. And they realize at one point in their life, it just doesn't matter anymore. How many celebrities in recent years committed suicide? Individuals, famous individuals, who had the world in the palm of their hands. And you tell yourself, you know, and the world, the world looks at them and it says, why 
why would he do that? He was such a good person, wink, wink, right? Because that's how we see people. But at the end of the day, here's what was missing. There was something lacking inside of them. They didn't have what we have. You see, as, as we sung that song earlier, we know that we're gonna be tried by fire, purified. But we know that that trying that we're gonna go through, we know that that's the handiwork of a loving father who wants us so dearly that that's the way that he uses to bring us and keep us into his fold. Amen? Mercy. Mercy is another powerful theme in that prodigal, gun, prodig prodigal son uh, parable. Patience. There was no judgment. These are all words and themes that we ourselves, we're all guilty of. We can be very unmerciful. We can be very judgmental. We can become very impatient. We're all guilty of it. I know I was be very honest with you, I, I struggle in every one of these areas. But every time that I struggle in these areas, those are the moments where I know that I'm being purified. And God is doing a work in my life. And I might have to go through it a dozen times. And to tell you the truth, I don't want to go through it a dozen times. You know? But what, what, what was that, uh, uh, the movie Rocky, when uh, Rocky won, when at the end of the fight, when somebody goes up to Rocky after the fight was over, and they say, Rocky, Rocky, are you, do you want a rematch? And he's all bloodied up. He says, no one, no rematch. That's how I am. When I go through some stuff, I, I don't want a rematch. When I go through some stuff with my wife, my children, or I go through a conflict, I say, I don't want to go through this anymore. And sometimes we just don't learn. And we need to use those experiences to help other individuals relate to what we've gone through. The most powerful story that we have is our testimony. Brothers and sisters, our testimony is your most powerful evangelizing tool. We are prodigals. But because of the love of a father who never had a judging mentality towards us, who didn't grow impatient with us, whose grace was sufficient for us, he came after us. The beauty, an additional beauty of the story of the prodigal son is that I, I reread this and I said, where is it in here? Let me see. It says that he came to his senses. Um, no, not, not there. He came to his senses. Uh, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare and here I am starving? Well, that's it. He just, he just came to his senses. It didn't say that he came to his senses, then he went and he took a, a bath, he cleaned himself up, he wanted to put a nice tie and a suit on, he wanted himself you know, to look good before his father. He said, no. I would, I would contend that when the father saw him coming down the road, he saw an individual that was just completely broken, raggedy, just filled with everything all the burdens of life, all the sins of his life. And the father saw that. He didn't hold back. He ran to him, he embraced him. He didn't have to clean himself up. And you see, it's something we have to remind individuals that God loves you just where you are. You don't have to get yourself, get your life right first. God, God's gonna guide you through a process of sanctification. But right now, just the way you are, come, take and see of the goodness that God has to offer to you. You see, he had to be at the end of himself. We all know individuals who are right there, right there at the end of themselves. They're in a moment of suicide, a moment of giving up. What do they want to do? They want to take their lives. In the recent news, we heard of a, an individual, a teacher who uh, was found doing some very sinful things. And he lost his job. And uh, 
wife from my little house? And what was his option? His options were two. Forgive me, Lord, for I've sinned. And I'm willing to pay the consequences of the sin that I've committed. Or take his life, right? Those are his options. And you see, the lost, sometimes that's their only option. Because they believe that there is no hope. The shame of knowing that people know my sin. You see, I, if I were very honest with you, if I were to put every one of my sins up on a whiteboard for me, I don't think any of you would want me as your pastor. And that's the truth. And I don't like admitting that to you. But that's who we are as Christians. We can't forget where we came from. Every one of us has an ugly, ugly history in our life. But the beauty of it is that God forgave every one of those sins. We didn't desperately run and say, you know what, I'm just gonna take my life. I'll be honest with you, I, I did have a moment in my life where I, 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 didn't, I didn't attempt suicide, but I just didn't want to live anymore. And I think we've all had those moments. I, I just said, why is my life falling apart? This just isn't worth it anymore. God, you know, why are you allowing me? I'm a good person. Why would you allow this to happen to me? I said, you know, maybe it's just better if I just take my life. And the love of a father whispered in my ears, and he reminded me of the love that he had for me. And he reminded me of the selfishness that I was, I was, depicted by saying that I just, I just want to just give up on life. You see, he was reminding me that I'm going to try you by fire right now. And it's not going to be pretty. But I won't give up on you. And that's what we need to remind the lost that are out there. That he's never, he's never gonna, going to give up on us. When we consume what the world feeds us, it makes us who we are. Do you know that? The Bible says that be in the world, but not of the world. But when we, be, when we live too much in the world, we become of the world. And that's the dynamic of life, that we need to learn to separate ourselves from being in the world and of the world. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not referring to physical food in, in, in this uh, instance. I'm not, you know, There is a need that we have as Christians to belong, to be valued. And sometimes we find ourselves that the only way that we're gonna feel needed and valued is that we want to associate with, with whatever the world you know, is offering us. And we feel that because of all, all of our friends are doing this, we wanna be a part of that too. And, and we forget that who we are as a child of God is that we're not like those individuals. So we need to carefully find a way that we stay connected to individuals who are living a worldly life, but to demonstrate that we are the light of the world, that we are different, that we can say no to a situation that is asking us, be part of the world. You know, what was it that, that, that witch in the movie Sleeping Beauty? Look at this apple, beautiful apple, eat, eat. That's what the world is doing to us. That's what the devil does to us. He gives us that perfect, beautiful, shiny apple. He says, eat, eat of this apple. And because we're weak in our faith, we, we just don't know any better. Our morals today are what we surrender to. Wealth, power, and money. I said this before, I'll say it again. Murder is associated with three Things that drive it, money, power, and sex. If you watch all these murder shows, they'll always tell you that 99% of them, money, power, and sex. We commit spiritual murder every day of our lives when we succumb 
to money, power, and sex. It's no different. Because we're driven by money because, oh, I, I want to have all this stuff. The Bible speaks more of the love of money and the sinfulness of that. It says, don't love money. It says, now, now money's a necessity. I'm not, I'm not saying that money's bad. But when our pursuit of money and wealth is more important than anything else, we, come, we become very disconnected to the provision of our Heavenly Father. We want power, we want all this. And what happens when we pursue power in life? It's all about me. We want people to see me. We, at that point, re-essential, we're dethroning God, saying, God, step off the throne, I'm the man. Look at me, I'm the one in control. I'm the man with the power. Sex, spiritual sex. I spoke a couple months ago of uh, every one of us who are adulterers. We're adulterers from the spiritual perspective that um, we're like prostitutes, fornicating with the world. Those are some hard words to hear. Might not like them, but it's not my word. It's right out of the Bible. Read the book of Hosea. It's a great lesson. Abraham Maslow was the native of a worldly individual who, uh, who gave his famous uh, Maslow, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And it was about, he spoke of self-actualization. He spoke that you can become all you want in the pursuit of, of being the perfect person that you want by continuing to climb a hierarchy, by just reaching certain milestones in life. That's what the world teaches individuals. I'm going to make a case that none of that really matters to any one of us. There is, uh, some of you may know who this individual is, uh, Charles Colson. Charles Colson is the founder of Prison Fellowship. He's the individual responsible for putting Bibles and beginning active Bible ministries in the prisons of today. Uh, if you look at the stories of what that ministry has done, it, 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 I, I don't think that, that there will be a, a, a tear that is not shed by that individual. But I love something that uh, one of the, his fondest sayings was this, he says that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Imagine speaking to the most destitute in the world, the fornicators, the murderers, the adulterers, the liars, the thieves, individuals who have committed some of the most heinous crimes in society. And he speaks out to them, he says, right here, Right here, at the foot of this cross, it's all level. God sees you, the liar, the same way he sees this person, the mass murderer. God sees us all the same. And you see, that perspective is where we lose how we reach out to the lost out there. We're no different. And we need to be able to share that in such a way that people realize that God doesn't judge the sinner based on the level of his sin. Like I said earlier, if you knew all the, 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 the garbage that God has cleaned in me, you might question, well, I don't know if he's really qualified to be a pastor, but here's what I'm gonna tell you. It's because he cleaned me up through all that that I believe that I'm qualified to be a pastor because that's the work that he's done in my life. That's why the passion that I have for his word, my passion to minister, is where it is because I was lost and I'm found. You were lost and am now found. And I am on that level playing field, like Charles Colson has said. He didn't judge me for who I was. Matter of fact, he didn't judge me at all. Nobody has a greater or lesser value before the Lord. Nobody does. He died for every one of us. And he, and, and he will embrace us just as we are. 
for those who are willing to accept their separation from God and allow themselves to see that meaninglessness of life apart from Him, there awaits a greater relationship. The relationship that we all lack in life, it's an intimate one. Your friends, your family, your lost friends and family need to see you just the way you are. And they need to know that you are where you are because a loving father ran to me one day. He embraced me before I cleaned myself up. He put his arms around me and he had a feast for me. And he put a robe on me and he put a ring on my finger. And he welcomed me back. He didn't judge me for what I did. He just loved on me. And that's what I'm asking all of us to do. Love on the lost that are out there. Don't judge them. Be patient with them. Continue to go after them. Do what our Heavenly Father has done for the prodigal son. Embrace the world of lost individuals because they need every one of us to bring them back home. Amen. May the Lord bless you. Let us let us stand. As we prepare for uh, for outreach, the preparation of outreach, the most important tool to have in our toolbox is love. Because when we love one another, when we love the lost, then we will go out there and we will win them for the kingdom of God. But if you don't love them, <laughs> you're not gonna be moved. So the first thing we have to ask God is, Lord, that's what I did, that's what my husband did. Lord, we don't want any one that we know, especially our family, to go to hell. So help us to win them for the kingdom. Help us, oh God. Allow them to escape hell because we don't want them to go to hell. And that was our main prayer. Lord, I don't want my brothers and sisters to go to hell. Lord, I don't want my mother and father to go to hell. Lord, I don't want my grandparents to go to hell. Lord, I don't want all of my friends to go to hell. That's how we pray. Show us, teach us. Give us a love for the lost. We complicate the gospel, but all we really have to do is ask God to give us love right if we love one another if we love our family like pastor margarito said let's not love them to hell let's love them to the kingdom well what's it going to cost me i must warn you that once you begin to win souls for the kingdom of god you're going to make enemies every demon and every witch and Satan himself is going to rise up against you I don't want you to think that it's going to be a piece of cake because it's not when you begin to witness for the kingdom of God it's going to cost you your life but he gave us life so that we could be his hands, so that we could be his feet, so that we could be his voice, so that we could be his hands. We are an extension 
of the king. And he saved us precisely for that, for the great commission that we would make disciples. Lord, we need to have a burden for the lost sheep in these days. We don't want to love them to hell. Oh, mijo, no le pegue porque está bien. No le diga eso porque eso, bendito, le molesta. That's going to bother him, so don't, don't let him know he's going to hell. Don't tell him he's got to repent. Don't tell her not to do this. Don't tell her not, you know, there's parents like that, right? There's parents that, they're scared. They're scared. They love their children so much that they love them all the way to hell. But we loved our children so much that they heard us witness to them all the time. You're not gonna like this son, you're not gonna like this daughter, but we're gonna tell you the truth. The word of God says he is the truth and he is the way and he is the life. Father, we've all been prodigals. We were so lost, but you had so much love for us, oh God, that you sent your son to die for someone like me. It was your love that drew us. It was by your love, oh God, that you sent your love, your only son, to die on the cross so that we might have another opportunity, so that we might have life. Allow us to understand, oh God, that we are all prodigals and that we're saved by grace. It's not anything that we have done or earned, oh God. It's only your mercy. And yes, we're going to go through the fire. Because the enemy, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And the last thing that he wants us to do is to multiply and to make disciples. But Lord, here I am. Send me. Allow me to be your hands. Allow me to be your feet. Allow me to be your voice. Allow me, O oh God. Allow me, O oh God. Because I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Because it's the power of God. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. And I will not deny you. Allow me to be a light in this dust, darkness, O oh God. Lord, from this morning, O oh God, I pray, O oh God, lift up your hands and ask God, if you really want him to send you out, if you really want him to use you, if you want to be a witness for the kingdom of God, you raise your hand right now and you let him know that you are an extension of the kingdom, that you are an ambassador of Jesus Christ, that you want him to use you as a monumental tool to bring the gospel, the good news to the lost. We thank you for your grace, oh God. We thank you for your love, oh God. We thank you for giving us a burden for the lost. We thank you, Lord, because it's only by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not by power or by, but only by the power of the Holy Spirit, oh God, that we're able to move and breathe and have our being. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.